Hello, everyone, and welcome to Path to the Priesthood, the podcast where we sit down with clergymen from around the country, and we ask them what it was that brought them to ordained ministry in Christ's church. I'll be your host, Christo Papadimus. We have a very special guest for you today, someone who's a good friend of mine. But before we begin our interview with him, let's hear a little bit about him. Father Dimitri Constantine, the son of Father Tom and Presbyter of Basiliki Constantine, grew up in Tennessee, Indiana, and Ohio with his eight siblings. His father is the former priest at St. John the Forerunner Greek Orthodox Church in Youngstown, Ohio, where Father Dimitri was an active member of the Goya, altar service, choir, and dance troupe. He graduated from Poland Seminary High School in 2011 and went on to study religious studies at Hellenic College. Father Dimitri spent his college summers working at Camp Nazareth as a counselor and program director, during which time he began dating Presbytera Maria Ventulumis, whom he married in August of 2015. Upon graduating from Hellenic College, he attended seminary at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and graduated with a Master's of Divinity in 2018. He then began working as the administrator at St. Herman of Alaska Christian School, an Orthodox K-8 school at Holy Resurrection Orthodox Church in Boston, where he spent three wonderful years while simultaneously serving the community of St. Demetrius in Weston, Massachusetts, as the Protopsaltis for five years. Just prior to leaving Boston in May of 2021, he completed the Certificate of Byzantine Music from HCHC. In the summer of 2021, Father Dimitri was assigned to St. Demetrius Warren by his Eminence Metropolitan Service of Pittsburgh, where he officially began serving as pastoral assistant on September 1st. On December 11th, the feast day of St. Philothea, Father Dimitri was ordained to the Holy Diaconate which was followed by his ordination to the Holy Priesthood on February 19th, 2022. Father Dimitri, along with, along with his wife, Prez Maria, have enjoyed being part of the beautiful St. Demetrius community in Warren, Ohio. Together, they look forward to many more wonderful years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Father Dimitri. Thank you, Krista. Thank you. Uh, I'm very excited to to have you on the show today, Father Dimitri. For those of you watching, Father Dimitri and I were not only at the seminary together, but we were in the same class and graduated the same year and took many of the same classes together. And we uh, we enjoyed those classes very much. Um, so thank you for for being on today. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's nice to see you. It's nice to be on with uh, with you. And uh, I'm excited to, uh, you know, be a part of this whole um this, these interviews that you've been doing for clergy, I think this is a really nice program and a really nice ministry that you're running. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I appreciate it. So we heard a little bit about you, um, a general overview in your biography, but I'd like you, if you if you would be so kind, to take us to the beginning um, before you were Father Dimitri and take us to maybe your childhood or what led you to um, to the priesthood where you uh, where you now serve. Yeah, so that is a that's a good question. That's a and that I'm sure you get all kinds of responses, long ones, short ones. Um, you know, when people ask me this question, I, I kind of I I tend to, to 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 preface it by saying, well, you know, as you may or may not know, everyone's call to the priesthood is different. But if you could categorize it, I, I would say that there's like there's really like two types of ways that people are called to the priesthood. One is a very obvious single moment in time where you have this, you know, this revelation. This is what the Lord is calling me to do. I'm going to go and apply to seminary right now. And so that's one way. But mm -hmm. and the other way I would say is that, you know, some people kind of have like more of a gradual gravitational pull to the seminary, to the church, to serve the Lord in that capacity. So totally. for me, I mean, I don't know if there was one specific moment where I could say, ah, this is what I need to do with my life. I think I think my entire life kind of was almost like this gravitational pull towards serving the Lord through the priesthood and to, you know, towards going to Hellenic College, Holy Cross. And so uh so yeah, so to kind of like get into some of the details of that, if that's what you want to hear. Sure. Um <laughs> Uh, you know, my dad is a priest and, yeah. um, my, when I was, uh, let's see, when I was, I don't know, 12 or so, 13, 11 or 12, my brother ended up going to the seminary. Oh, and wow. So, okay. So yeah, he's, he's a good six years. Yeah. Six years older than me. 
Um, and he, uh, he, I remember like, this was very formational for me at the time. Cause you know, as a 12 year old, I'm kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're becoming older and more mature and, you know, you're going from middle school to high school and yeah. middle, you know, whatever, so there's a lot going on. And uh, you start to, you start to, to think more like an adult in some ways. Totally. And, um, you know, for me to see him go and do that, I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool, you know, but I think what started to kind of form me and and kind of make an impression on me was seeing the seeing the relationships and the friendships that he developed when he was up at the school cool so having moved a few times with my dad being a priest you know it was hard and, and we were homeschooled we were homeschooled so we didn't oh, have i did not know that okay yeah we didn't have you know these public school communities where you know we have these consistent friends you know and and con Moving around, we we kind of had each other. We had our siblings. Sure, and, and you so, have you have a lot of siblings, so luckily you have. And I do. Yeah. And I do. Yeah. Good support yeah. group. So thankfully, there was never a dull moment, and we always had you know the support of each other. Um, but for me to see the the friendships that he formed up at the seminary, up at Helena College and Holy Cross, he did seven years there as well. Um, which brother is this father? Is it, this is Father Eleftherios Constantine. So it is. Okay, it is. I know several yeah. of your siblings went to the school. Okay, so this is Father Eleftherios. Okay, cool. Right, right. So so to see him come home from the seminary on, you know, Christmas break, Thanksgiving break, spring break, you know, and he would come home and, and a lot of times he would bring some of his friends with him. Cool. And to see like the fun that they had and like the, the relationships that they had and to uh, to witness that was kind of very formational to me because I was like, okay, you know, I had this longing for these types of friendships. Yeah. And, um, you know, from that point, I was kind of like, oh, well, you know, I, I hope to have these someday. Now, cool. once I started going to Camp Nazareth, you know, for summer camp, and I did Crossroad at some point, you know, when I was a junior in high school, you know, I started to, to to develop some of these friendships. It was always harder for me with public school. And that's, you know, there's nothing against the people in public school. It was just, you know, being a, a transplant into a new community totally. um, was hard. It was a hard adjustment. So, um, you know, there's always, there's this beautiful uh, depth that comes with a relationship with someone who is Orthodox. You know, there's, yeah. when you share the same faith, there's a lot more you have in common. There's depth, there's a lot more depth to your relationship. And so for me to witness that and to experience that and and um uh and and those friendships that I started to develop through high school, um, I was like, okay, then you know, I want to go to a school where this is all the time and this is everywhere. You yeah, know, not just whenever we can manage to see each other, you know, for a week, once a year kind of a thing. Sure. Um so uh and that's not to say that, you know, I didn't didn't have and I don't and that's not to say that I don't have you know good relationships with people who are not orthodox I've got plenty of those the, yeah. those are but there's this depth and I, and I think you maybe understand what I'm saying there's this depth with that you have um you know when there's when when you have when you when you have a friendship and a relationship with somebody who is orthodox so absolutely so um so for me to so so my brother played an, an integral role in that obviously um my father you know, he, he never really pushed me to, he never said, you have to come and serve in the altar with me in the mornings, like on Sunday morning. Wow, you know? really? You, there was, there was that's a time. All, I mean, that's he awesome. Like, he kind of I mean, made it yeah. optional. He was like, you know, you could go with me, you could go with my mom. <laughs> you Good know? for him. Yeah. Yeah. So most of the time I chose to go with him because I wanted, I really liked serving the altar, you know. Yeah. When I was younger, it was more because I could get away with playing with fire and, you know, like. You know I mean, what? I, people... I don't think people realize what a big part of the altar that is like, you know, when we have parents of the church and they have sons. And if the son is a little apprehensive about um, joining the, the altar, we all know around 4th of July that like, you know, boys love playing with fire, lighting matches. And so like, I kind of, I slip it in, you know, as part of like, well, you get to play with fire. And I mean, it's not, it's of course, it's much more than, than playing with fire yeah. and lighting charcoals. Um, but that is a big part of it. Um, and so I'm always quick to add that. And they kind of look at me like, oh, really? And that kind of gets them to bridge that gap. Like, oh, if there's something fun back there, um, then I'll definitely, I'll definitely, you know, go serve. So that's funny. That was something that drew me to right. as 
Oh, they, and it still it still does. I, you know, anyway. Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's something fun about lighting a charcoal. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> to this day, I mean, we're we're grown to men. This day, I don't know what it is. It's like, yeah, like I'll I'll, I'll I'll volunteer to light the charcoal. Yeah, no, no, oh, I got this one. Let me light it. Let me light it. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So, so you start so you start serving in the altar with your dad. Um, and what what? Well, yeah. I mean, because Young. my older brothers were there and they could watch to keep an eye on me. I, I started, I think when I, when I was about seven years old is when I cool. first started serving the altar. So, yeah, sure. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, me and my brothers, we'd go and serve in the altar. That's what we did. So awesome. It was something for us to do on Sundays. And, um, you know, I didn't realize then that, you know, that was all part of this like formation and this, this gravitational pull that was leading me to something, um, to something even more than that. Uh, yeah, but uh, but yeah. So my dad, I mean, he was always very, um, very uh, supportive, and he didn't really ever push me to like do one thing or the other. He kind of left it up to me, and I really respect awesome. that because, you know, he could have been like, "Oh, you have to be a priest like me." You know? Yeah, you know, a lot of people think that's just what happens. Like they think that, right. like you know, the sons don't have a choice. I have a brother, and people always thought that, like one of us had to decide who was also going to go to the seminary. And we're like, no, actually that that's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and something else about my dad, I mean, if you've ever met my dad, you know that he's, he's a big teddy bear. Yeah. Right? He's, he's six foot three. He's got a big bushy beard. He's always smiling and cracking jokes. And yeah. you know, that's, that's his way of relating with people and, and people love that. You know, of that course. is something that is how, uh, you know, he's, he's able to bring a peaceful, loving healing presence into people's lives and um you know i am not my dad but i definitely have some of that in me and i i love to crack jokes and i love to you know oh, make yes. people smile and like that's uh that's something that you know i i don't know i guess it's it's not it was never an overt thing that i was like oh i want to be just like my dad and go yeah. and do this and like it was totally. kind of like eventually i realized like oh you know i love working with people i love helping people Mm -hmm. I love teaching. I, I love, you know, being able to, to bring truth and hope and joy into people's lives. And what way, what better way to do that than through uh, pursuing the priesthood? Um, yeah. So, so my dad, I mean, his, he was a huge, huge factor in that in, in, in a very subtle way, you know, that's the best because way, I think. Yeah, the best way. I mean, because he's, he's always been there my whole life. Yeah. He's totally. always been there my whole life. And so, um, you know, it's it's one of those things that just kind of like quietly, gently like formed me into who I am today, and and it obviously helped pave some of that path that lead me led me to the seminary. Of course, you know you mentioned your sense of humor that you got from your dad, and that you share as well. And Don't I, get me wrong, my mom also has a sense of humor. <laughs> I think I think that's a natural what you find, right? Is like you know if if the child has a good sense of humor, there's a chance both parents are pretty funny uh, <laughs> in, in their own ways, and. Of course, the seminary is, it is a very serious place. Um, you go and you study serious, amazing, um, life-changing things. Um, but it is a hilarious place, actually. And uh, I mean, you meet a lot of people with good senses of humor, uh, uh, professors included. And I think my favorite part of, one of my favorite parts of the seminary was the 10 minutes before our classes and the 10 minutes after our class. <laughs> We're gathered in there waiting for the professors and we all uniquely have the same work and not work schedule, but we have the same class load, the same um, right. chapter schedule where we're doing many of the same things. We're all in it together. Um, and so we could uniquely just share like uh, jokes or, or observations about things that we were going through. And those 10 minutes, you know, in a very work intense environment, really, um, they really highlighted uh, a lot of my memories there. And so and a lot of those were with you, of course. So I, I absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I, I remember just like, you know, ba barely being able to keep it together once the professor got there or, you know, <laughs> yeah, I was close sometimes even during class too. Uh, oh yeah. We were, oh, we were yeah. always respectful, but um, you know, there's always, 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 always uh, a light sense of humor in the air. Um, so your dad, your dad led you kind of by example, right? Like you said, not right. it was the opposite of a heavy handed approach, just a natural nurturing, um, direction in your life. And so you ended up first at Hellenic college, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So now you're at Hellenic college and what are your impressions of being there having been, um, you know, coming up through being homeschooled and now you're at Hellenic college and what, what do you remember about your first 
years at Hellenic because I'm sure they are different than your years on Holy Cross there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's funny. So right after I graduated college, I got married. So oh, for me, okay. college was like, you know, single days and then seminary was married days. It was very different so, then. Was it? Yeah. Very, very, very different experiences. And even, even like living conditions, right? Like as, as a single person and you know, you know what the dorms are like, but I lived in the dorms for four yep. years. And then in married as a married person, I was in the married student housing, which is the opposite end, end of campus. Mm -hmm. um, so very different experiences in in that regard. But um, you know, I, I don't know when you have a when you have a wife to to ground you and to uh, yeah to to help you become the best version of you that you can be. I mean, you know that your experience is totally different than when you're a single person. I mean, so for me, yeah. like in in undergraduate, I. Uh, you know, I wasn't as serious, you know, and of course I was, I was in, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, there's something that father Maximus said in one of his classes, mm -hmm. um, that really stood out to me and it kind of helped me start to straighten out a little bit. Um, really? Because when I got there, I was like, Oh, you know what? I'm out of the house. I, I don't have my parents watching over me or taking care of me anymore. I'm kind of a master of my own schedule. Yeah. And so I can do whatever I want, you know, and so it's like, yeah, I can show up late to class or, oh, yeah, I can, you know, get away with this and that. And it's like, you know, I feel like everybody kind of goes through a phase like that at some point sure. where you kind of like push the boundaries and you kind of figure out your way. And um, uh, and so the thing that Father Maximus said, because at the time he he was actually teaching undergrad classes. Which I was going to ask, what, what, do you remember what class it was? I had him in the graduate school, of course, but obviously I didn't go to college there, so I didn't have his uh, college courses. Right. So in, in, I remember in undergrad, he taught he taught a Great Lent and, and Pascha class. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. So I remember that. And he also taught, oh, there was one more that I don't think I was able to take so so what he said was in the grant lit or the great lens and possible i think it was that class it could have been one of his talks it could have been a sermon i'm not really sure yeah he, gave, he yeah he had a lot of a lot of those two a lot of memorable quotes from his chapel sermons and and just kind of his uh not lectures but talks like you said that he would give from time to time on campus so so right. what did he say to you that enlightened you or kind of changed your life it sounds like well it was it was kind of pivotal for me in some ways because he said you know he was talking about the fact that we have an undergraduate seminarian program. Yes. So like you, you have a seminary, which is grad school, right? It's yeah. it's either MDiv or MTS, it's th two, three, four years, whatever. And that's after you have already have a bachelor's degree. But, you know, now we, we have this master, uh, uh, not a master's, it's the, um, it's the religious studies class, the course, religious studies. Okay. There's A and there's B. Religious studies A is the seminarian track. So you're like kind uh. of fast tracking to go to the seminary. Right. And so he was kind of questioning that. And he was like, you know, when you show up to the first year, your seminary, first year of undergrad, and you're kind of there because you want to go into the priesthood eventually, you know, you're feeling called to serve the Lord through the priesthood. And you want to go to the seminary afterwards. It's like you have seven years. So you show up, you know, your first day and you have seven years ahead of you, you know, to um, to uh, before you graduate from the seminary. And it's like, who's going to be in any kind of rush to grow and to, to be serious and to get anything done, like to learn. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, I was like, who's going to be in any, like, cause I, you know, seven years is a long time. It is. Like that's, 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 you know, some, some you could become a doctor in seven years. Yeah, you, you know can. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So like, that's a, that's a long time to spend in one place doing more or less the same thing. Yeah. Studying. So why would you be in thing? any rush to yeah. to to like straighten yourself out and to to figure this out and you know, and so um so that kind of helped guide me a little bit because I was like you know what this is more important than me just messing around and having freedom, you know this is important because um you know we don't have all the time in the world we do not we don't we really don't um. And so, you know, from that point forward, I, I started taking some of my classes more seriously. I, cool. um, you know, I started uh, trying to surround myself with friends who were going to make me a better person, you know, yeah. people who were going to push me to be better. Yeah. And, um, you know, that really helped a lot. Uh, it also helped that, you know, around that time, I think this is probably midway through undergrad, you know, I started dating my wife, Pres Maria, and, um, yeah. uh, you know, she was, she is, uh, you know, she's a very diligent 
and hardworking person. And she was like, what do you mean you're okay with getting a B minus? You know? It's like, <laughs> thank God. Thank <laughs> like God. you need to like put some time and effort into this. Like, you know, yeah. make it a good paper, you know, that kind of thing. I'm like, oh gosh, you know, like <laughs> between Maria. That was okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. And now Maria, you guys met, she's obviously Maria's dad is, is a priest, a veteran priest in the metropolis of Pittsburgh, Father John Tulumis, right. correct? Um, yeah. And so did you meet her like at summer camp? Was she living in Boston? How did how did that work? How did you guys actually meet? Yeah, great question. So um, so we we met. I mean, it was probably sometime when my dad, my family moved to uh, the, the Ohio area, Youngstown area, um, because before we were in Fort Wayne, which is under the metropolis of, New, of Detroit. Oh, wow. So. So we we weren't in the same metropolis as her family. Her dad has been a priest at Holy Trinity in Pittsburgh for thirty years. So is they've been the there. Metropolis Cathedral, or is that a different parish? Uh, no, it's it's a different. It's uh, it's in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And that's had been his longtime post, and he's been there for many years. Okay. Right. Right. So when we entered into the metropolis, you know, I was maybe I don't know ten, eleven, around that age. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's probably when we met at some time. You know summer camp or clergy family event, you know, the metropolis of Pittsburgh metropolitan Maximus at the time had kind of oh. set the precedent. He goes, you know, we, we have a metropolis clergy family Christmas party every year. And cool. so all the Chris, all the, all the clergy families would come to the metropolis. We'd have a Christmas party and, you know, there are other metropolis wide clergy events. Thank you know, there's you. the, um, the clergy family retreat every year, every other year, every year, something like that. So, we mm -hmm. used to go to those things. And so we knew each other from that. Sure. Okay. Cool. Um, it wasn't until we were on both on staff at summer camp that we really started, you know, uh, talking and dating and, and stuff like cool. that. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So you're at, you're kind of midway through the seminary now. Father Maximus has enlightened you with some wisdom. Maria yeah. set you on, uh, set you on a good path. Um, what were some of, what are some of your, um, favorite experiences or memories of now the seminary now you're in the graduate program um things are a little different than undergrad and how was it different and, and what things did you enjoy most about your time in uh in holy cross great question that was like three questions <laughs> it was secret the bang bang um pick you yeah, know summarize and pick one um yeah. just tell me what what were your takeaways from uh from your time at the school i have i know one of one of my favorite things from the seminary was our senior trip that we that we went on together and it's it's interesting I remember obviously I remember every year of the seminary but that senior trip which I think lasted between the first and the second half parts a and b I think maybe it was like five or six weeks but um for me it felt like an entire year in a good way just because of how much we learned and how much we experienced and I still am reminded of those experiences on you know the yearly feast days from the the holy sites we visited um and i uh, especially enjoyed your company on on that senior trip as well we had some right. good times but um but yeah for yeah. you um what oh, uh, i mean i mean a definite highlight is 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 the senior trip yeah, yeah the, the saint helen's pilgrimage um yeah because we were i mean we left what it was end of may something like that be yeah. beginning of june and we were we were i mean if you did a and b you didn't get back until like mid-july end of july something like that yeah it was a, a yeah. solid couple months we spent um traveling yeah. studying the language and um and visiting yeah the, yeah holy sites and yeah i mean i thought it was i thought it was great to to be able to go on that trip because um um it, it was unique in a lot of ways yes because i think from years past and the years that that followed uh i don't think anyone ever went to cyprus oh that's right. They would rotate out that third country, right? So it was like Holy Lands, Constantinople, and then a, uh, and then you would go to another country to see Orthodoxy, right? And we lucked right. out on Cyprus. Yeah. Yeah. So it was unique getting into Cyprus. I mean, the Holy Land. I mean, there's you don't really have. I don't really have a lot of words to describe the experience of being in the Holy Land. Yeah. Um, Constantinople was its own. Yeah. I mean, that was also incredible. Um, had you had you ever been to any of those places before and have you been back I know for me it was my first time seeing all those places and I've not been back since so I'm feel I'm very very blessed we were able to experience it yeah no I I um I have not been back um and it was, it was my first time at all those places so yeah um so yeah it was it was obviously a, an amazing experience but I think that one of the most unique things and one of my favorite things about it was that we had a pretty small senior class 
We did actually. Yeah. And I think there were like, what, maybe 14 of us total on that trip. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, obviously it was great that I got to bring my wife with me and I know father yeah. Bryce brought his wife as well, Pres Elise. And so like they had, they at least had, you know, each other's company to be, but then it was like the rest of us dudes, just like, you know, <laughs> it was, it was guys being dudes and taking like, like uh, you know, sweaty bus rides for like eight hours, oh, and, you know, man. across the countryside of Greece. And, yeah. <laughs> I remember that one bus and the air conditioning didn't, it was, it was an amazing. It was that one, one that the air conditioning wasn't working and it was so hot. And like, and it happened to be like the longest trip, the hottest day. Right. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Man. Um, no, I mean, it was. Uh, I, I love that it was so, so small because, you know, obviously some of us had, we had small classes at the seminary mm -hmm. and like those were always nice, but you know, the, it's, it's different when you're sitting in a classroom with your, with your, with your friends and classmates versus, you know, sitting on buses or, you know, visiting holy sites and venerating relics and, you know, doing all these incredible things like the experience is much more intense and it's much, there's a yeah. lot more room for like fellowship and, um, you know, totally. growing together and growing in our relationship with each other. And, um, you know, I, I felt so much closer to, to so many of my classmates, yeah. you know, after that trip, as opposed to, you know, before. So like that, that trip was really nice to like kind of gel our whole group together, which was great. Um, which I think is harder to it's harder to achieve that when you have like you know 30 or 40 people on a big trip like that you know definitely definitely and um one of the things I enjoyed about it too is that each one of us has kind of our own particular areas of interest you know when it comes to the faith and so you know as we'd go to the different sites someone would teach the rest of us we were teaching each other very um memorable things and um, for those of you watching, Father Dimitri is a very good chanter. And um, so at every site, we would chant the Apolitikia of whatever um, whatever site we were visiting. And, you know, sometimes we'd go to these sites and there'd be a nice uh, monk or a nun leading our tour. And then they would say, OK, what Apolitikia and would you like to chant? And we'd all kind of like we'd look at Dimitri and just, we'd be like, go, Dimitri. And, uh, and you would lead us. Uh, and these are politikia, and to this day, when we chant them on the feast days, it's it's always enjoyable, of course, to chant with the full church. But it was very special to chant with um, our classmates in the sites where these um, politikia are what they were written for. Um, and I think one of the craziest memories was uh, the vigil we attended on Mount Athos at San Fondos. and um, you know, it's it's the big leagues, shall we say, of uh, of services and worship. And of course, they had the choir of monks at the Saltirion. Um, and then, you know, like three or four hours into the service, you know, I'm I'm in the chair, kind of half asleep, half paying attention. And then I hear a very familiar voice, and it was you chanting uh, at the chance time. It was just uh, just amazing. So uh, those are definitely um, cool memories that you know at least sustain me to this day in my ministry, and I'm sure for you the same thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was it was funny because. Um... I think I was, I mean, I, I wanted to be up there chanting with them because mm -hmm. I was like, oh, how cool would that be to be able to chant with the monks for the vigil or whatever. But I was like, I'm not going to, I'm just going to, you know, I'm not here for that. I'm here to yeah. just be, you know, to experience, to worship, to experience, you know, the monastery and to not really like, you know, throw anything off. Well, I was close enough where they could hear me doing Isan. Oh. And so one of them came and grabbed me like, you, you know, and so I like, grabbed me and like pulled me out to the chant stand. And so, like, I chanted a few hymns, you know, I think I got to do the Apolitikian of St. Demetrius, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's amazing. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, I forget. I, I, mean, I don't even remember. I mean, I should remember this, but I don't remember even what the vigil was for. Or, I, I don't either. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember the time of year we were there. I mean, it was there was a lot of amazing things going on, but because... Um, and then I think we were going back and forth between some old calendar places, new calendar places that had like different feasts. Right, going. right. And I, I can't totally remember what it, I can't remember what the feast was either, because I can't remember when we were there. But um, right. But it was it was a big feast. And uh, and there you were chanting away. So that was that was very cool. Um, yeah, just um, lifelong. One of the other things that um, I really enjoyed our trip to New York. Oh, that's we went, right. We, Remember we we got those white vans when we uh, actually I, I was one of the drivers. I did. <laughs> you drove us from Boston to New York City driving the that's, van. That's around, right. Uh, yeah, we did. It was it was fun. And we we went to the archdiocese and um, you know met with a lot of the archdiocese leadership and got a kind of an idea. It was like, oh, this is this is like the back end of the archdiocese that we you don't really see and right. It, that was cool. yeah, and it was it was fun to like you know to there was just you know more opportunity for bonding and growth with the senior class and everything. So. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny you mentioned earlier how your brother's friendships um, and like the parea he had with with the people he met at the school was something you envied the most. And I think I think everyone you talk to who graduated the school would agree that that's kind of one of the most special things about the schools, the connections you make, because then when we go off, right, we go off into parishes and, and there's wonderful parishioners and everything, but we're on a certain side of, of parish life. Um, and right. at the school, we're all in it together. On the parish side, you know, sometimes there's a Proist Dominus and Voitho, uh, but mo for the most part, we're we're alone um, on on the things that we experience and, and we work through. So um, right. I'm glad the school bonds us as tightly as it does so that we we have people um we can we can call and catch up with and, and bounce um situations off of um because that's uh that's what keeps us going yeah it's and it's amazing because i don't know how this happens but it's like i could call anybody i could call anybody from our class or like you know most anyone from like the time we were up there and just i could just cold call them and like it'd be like we were you know we revert back in time to like when we were there together and it's like yeah. you know it's like it's like no time went by at all totally, you know? totally. yeah yeah so i know that i know i've called you before and you know some of the other classmates and it's just like we go back to sharing stories and inside jokes and stuff and uh, you know so um so yeah some of the other highlights though i mean i mean the chapel you can oh, of course as a as a chant group leader especially right yeah right well not even just that but like just the experience of having chapel twice a day and like being yeah. able to go and like be part of that every day. And like, you know, now I'm in a parish and um, we don't have daily services. I feel right. like the vast majority of parishes don't have daily services. So um, it's something that I miss. Yeah. But something that was very formative and, and obviously a highlight for my time there. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people complain about the cafeteria food, but I loved the calf. I don't know what I don't know. I loved it. I really did. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it it did it caught a lot of flack. You know, I guess people in general are always very critical of food, and then Greek people, even more specifically, um, are pretty critical of the food they eat. And yeah, I feel like every time walking in there, everyone felt like they were Gordon Ramsay and just would like you know judge yeah. the food. Meanwhile, the people in the calf would brave blizzards, no matter how shut down the rest of the city was. I remember. Kirio Nico's car would always be coming up um, um, yeah. the driveway. And somehow the kitchen staff would make it to cook for us um, in the midst of even the craziest blizzard. So good for you for sticking up for the camp. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I think they deserve a shout out. The old Cone Dacus refectory. I mean, they kept us alive, right? For, it, for did. <laughs> it did. It did. You know, um, uh, I have to say that now I'm thinking of some of my memorable experiences. Obviously, uh, intramural sports, oh, basketball and course, football. Probably not that's right. Of course. Yeah, those were a lot yeah. of fun. Um, even though our senior year, we were on the same team and we fell short. It was we had a good season, though. We had a good season. We had we had the team to win the, to, to win it all. But yeah, we're kind of like the Bills. Like we had the potential. We had, but we just we just we just couldn't put it together. Um, and you know what's yeah. funny? Like that's probably one of the things uh, I miss the most because it would happen every fall right it was a seasonal thing so every fall i think about it um when the weather changes i remember playing um yeah you know it'd be like rainy a little bit and then we'd be playing kind of sometimes in like the bitter cold um by the end of the season and those were those are great because in the classroom everybody's you know very respectful and they they offer their um theological insights which they have a great amount of and the football field they would offer quite different insights uh, so you <laughs> see it, it was good and i think that was good um those were good reminders for for ourselves to not take ourselves too seriously um i yeah, yeah absolutely i i think they're still doing those sports there um I, i'm yeah. sure they are, but i know you and father nick livingston used to organize it um and uh and those were those were some of the favorite memories too i would say yeah yeah good times for sure for yeah. sure um i will say um so kind of tracking backwards a little bit. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how much time we have, but um, tracking backwards a little bit to like kind of the call to serving the sure. Lord through the priesthood. Um, I did. So one of the things that was very formative for me was doing Crossroad. Ah, okay. Tell yeah, us a little so bit. What is, give us the elevator pitch. What is Crossroad? Yeah, yeah. So know, Crossroad, but, yeah. Crossroad is a 10 day vocational program. It's, it's mostly academic. And it's it's selective, so there's only about 30 students um, who come for the 10-day program. 
Um, at the time I did it in 2010, there were only two sessions. Now I think there's four sessions. And they do but anyway, the, the sessions. Country now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, there's two in Boston, one in Chicago, one in California. They come out here to San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so I, I went to that. I did that program. And my siblings before me did it. And they had a great time. So I was like, all right, well, I should do this. So I did it. And I ended up making some really, really great friends. Um, cool. And uh, I spent 10 days. And of course, you know, we lived in the dorms. We were on campus. So I kind of got like a 10 day, like really big, you know, appetizer of full what... introduction. Yeah, exactly. And kind of it kind of really um, I really enjoyed being there at, on campus. I enjoyed learning like you take many courses with professors. I was going to ask, they have little classes. OK, they do. Cool. Yeah. So when I was there, Father Harry Pappas was one of our professors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, did, and Father Radu Bordianu. Yeah. And who is the other one? I'm sorry. Father Radu Bordianu. He's a uh, he's a professor at Duquesne. He's the assistant priest in, uh, wow. in St. Holy Trinity in Pittsburgh. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. We ended up, you know, being um, well, he works with my father in law now. So it's like kind of funny. Like my Look at that. first introduction to him really was one was uh, before I even, you know, started dating Maria, Fresh Maria and everything. So cool. But anyway, so yeah, he um they both did an amazing job and I loved the classes we took with them and um, you know, the friendships, the outings. It's it's really a fantastic program that gives you um like a really nice uh like I mean, it really, it really spends all of its effort answering the question, like, what is vocation? Oh. And so, like, you kind of narrow the entire thing down to, like, vocation being one's unique and ongoing response to God's call to love the Lord your God with, with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. So the whole emphasis of the program is really that <clears throat> little sentence, right? Loving the Lord your God with all your strength, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, you know, you have as many classes, you have sessions led by professors or by, by a staff and um, you go visit churches and, you know, there's fun events and it's, it's really social stuff too. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a really fantastic program. And for me, you know, being a junior in high school, have, doing that program, I was like, okay, like I may be thinking about other career choices you know, I wanted to be a professional baseball player, but at that point, you know, not even playing for my high school team, I was like, eh, unless I pull a Michael Jordan, <laughs> you know, I don't think yeah. this is going to work out. So that, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, I was thinking about like architecture or construction management or something, you know, yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. And um, that kind of like started pushing those ideas out. I was like, no, no, you know, I, I really love learning about the faith. I love getting this deeper understanding of, you know, what exactly we believe and what we're doing, yep. you know, why we're Orthodox Christians and, and you know, what we do as Orthodox Christians. And um, for me, that was something that was also very formative and kind of like helped, you know, that, that it kind of increased the gravitational pull a little bit, if you will. So. Very good. Yeah. No, many different pieces working together to kind of guide you towards the seminary and the priesthood and obviously crossroads sounds like it was a it was a very big piece of that formation so i'm glad you i'm glad you went back to kind of touch on that so to let other people know maybe some other people will attend crossroad or other people who have attended crossroad will uh will um follow the same path perhaps who knows who knows yeah it, either way whether that's that whether crossroad leads you to on that path or not i mean it's it's a fantastic program that really added a lot of depth to my understanding of my faith you know like yeah my dad was a priest my my dad is a priest yeah and my brother is a priest and my brother-in-law is a priest and you know my uh father-in-law is a priest Wait, your brother your brother-in-law which priest is that father michael gavrilis oh yeah so he was actually classmates with my brother and he married my uh my older sister yeah. cool very yeah cool. Yeah, so he also serves in the Pittsburgh area. Um, so a lot of uh, family clergy in Pittsburgh, which is really nice. Um, Speaking of, of the Pittsburgh area, I know a lot of people um, think of Troy Palomalu when they think about the faith or like who is a, who's an active Orthodox Christian that kind of um, was in some kind of spotlight for a while. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I've never even been to Pittsburgh, but we won't get into why I'm a Steelers fan. Are, do you have any Troy Palomalu interactions? Does he does he come around? Is he still in Pittsburgh these days, or is he more in California? Or, and um, yeah, is he 
active in any of the churches. I know he, I know he does visit churches from time to time, but sometimes I think he establishes, you know, pretty meaningful connections with clergy or, or local monasteries in the area up there. So right. yeah, what's the, the Troy Palomalu situation up there? Yeah. You know, you know, he, um, he used to go to Holy Trinity in, in the North Hills of Pittsburgh. So okay. like his, his home parish was my father-in-law's parish. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I got to meet him a few times. I mean, he's a very down to earth, very like low key, very humble person. Um, yeah, very yeah. nice man. Yeah. yeah. So like very unassuming, you would never, you know, you would never know that he was like an NFL, you know, safety. You know what I mean? Hall like, of fame, can, safety. For, yeah. Hall of fame, safety. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, but he's uh yeah, great guy. I think he spends more time out in California now. But okay. again, I'm I don't I'm not really sure. I don't okay, so you like the Metropolis doesn't have him speak. Let me send him a text real quick and let you know. Yeah. <laughs> let's get him on. Let's let's have him join us. Um yeah. but uh but so like does Metropolis have him speak at events? I know he's very outside of the limelight. He likes to remain low key, but um so right, no right. Like, Metropolis events or anything like that for Troy. Okay, cool. No, I don't I don't think so. I think he likes to keep a low profile and I and I don't blame him. I don't God blame him. him. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But I mean, kind of going back to what I was saying, I mean, um, you know, uh, despite the fact that I have so much clergy in my family, like, you know, uh -huh. my, I learned about the faith in the house, in the home. Sure. I learned about the faith through Sunday school and, you know, other programs like that, but never in a way that was so in depth and so enriching and so inspiring and enlightening as I had, as, as when I went to Crossroad. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was really like, um, it was, it was a really nice, like, wait, like, whoa, there's a lot more to my faith than I ever realized. And yeah. so it was, a, it was like, like I said earlier, it was like an appetizer for like the main course. And of course you spend your rest of your life, you know, on that main course, because, you know, we're, Always no learn. matter, no matter how much you learn about God and about our faith and about, you're never, ever going to exhaust learn it all. Right. You're never going to learn it all. And you, and the, and the more you pray, the, the, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know anything at all. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. And you say the faith becomes real, you know, when you make it your own. So it sounds like, like, um, and for me too, like growing up in a clergy household, like the faith, the general concepts are there. The, um, the understanding, the general understanding is there and, and the way you live your life generally is there. But then when you learn about it by yourself with your own mind, um, without that rest of that support group there that's when it becomes your own and you start kind of living it um and i think that is integral when um when someone goes to serve the church even ordained or or a lay fashion so very cool it sounds like crossroad helped kind of bridge that gap between the family life and then the full learning of the seminary yeah yeah it was it was very um very influential and enlightening in a lot of ways yeah, yeah. So now as an ordained priest, um, what are kind of the, what are the things that the seminary prepared you for and, and you feel like you were kind of expecting in ordained ministry? And maybe what were some of the things that you had no idea um, you would be doing uh, in ordained ministry? Because I mean, it's, it's interesting, right? Like, the, like, I hear time and time again, you know, the joke is always, oh, you mean the seminary didn't train you for this? Or you didn't have a class in this, which is funny, because the seminary definitely um provides you with all the necessary courses to lay the foundation of the faith and try to it tries to prepare you for parish ministry as as much as it can but of course nothing is is the same as the real deal shall we say so what are some right. of the the things that lined up and what were some of the differences or things you did not expect in ordained ministry sure yeah um well you know it's like like with any job I mean, you go through an onboarding process and you mm -hmm. go through like job training and all that stuff. And like, yeah, that can like kind of give you an understanding of what it is you're going to be doing, but you don't really learn it until you actually start doing it. Yeah. So yeah, the seminary did a great job of preparing, you know, us, but like, it's hard to like, you know, no matter how much you prepare for something like. Uh, you, you're never actually going to to like start figuring out how to do it effectively until you've actually spent time making mistakes doing it. Yeah, making you know? mistakes and, and and learning on the job. Like uh, it's like like art. You know, you have a beautiful painting of Hagia Sophia behind you, right? Yeah. But you can yeah. you can study Hagia Sophia all you want. You can study. You know, you can watch art videos and you can watch. You can you can study. You can take courses on art, but if you unless you pick up the paintbrush and start doing it. 
Like you're not going to be able to put together a masterpiece until you're able to actually, you know, until you've logged hours and hours and hours of, of time doing that. Very well said. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things that people will say like, ah, the seminary didn't provide us with this knowledge or didn't, you know, prepare. Oh, us you mean sometimes, yeah, the graduates themselves will, yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, look, you but, know yeah. what? Like, we kind of have to trust what they're giving us. And obviously we can give them feedback and, you know, hopefully they take the feedback. Sure. But like, they, they have these courses that are there for a reason. And, um, you know, you kind of you kind of make what you will of it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you take what you're given you do the best what you can. You, you do the best you can with that. Then you try your very best to apply everything you know and everything you've learned yeah. into parish life. I mean, if you're as a clergyman, you're going to be serving in parish life. Not all priests will serve in parish life. Some of them will True. work with the archdiocese or teach at universities, and you know, etc. Sure. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things I also say is like, um, you know, as I started progressing through um seminary it's like yeah I, I took lots of notes and i actually still have all my notes filed away in file boxes oh, yeah. at my house but like i haven't really pulled them out very often yeah true you know like the, every once in a while i'll be like okay i know he said something specific about this topic and i want to really dive into that and i will like you know every once in a while I'll go and i'll dive through and i'll flip through the notes and be like ah that's right or i'm looking for a quote or something but I mean, a lot of that knowledge kind of like enters here and then you have to let it sink into here. Yeah, totally. You know, and, um, you know, once and I, and I really think that's that's part of like what we call formation at the seminary mm -hmm. and formation is it comes from different places. It's not just the classroom. Right. Right. It comes from like our our fellowship and our friendship. Right. Mm -hmm. So all the things that we do together, whether it's intramural sports or just studying in the same library room desk whatever together or like sure. you know going out for for a burger at you know you know a local pub or something like that like you know like those those types of things also play a role in formation but then there's also like the examples that are set for us by the older seminarians yeah. or the professors or the staff and like you know there's a lot of people that I still you know recall often and i'll be like oh that person really really carried themselves really well and they really yeah. handled that situation really well and it's like that's how i want to handle these types of situations yeah so that's all part of the formation yeah and you know of course there's you know there's things like when i was in when i was an undergrad seminarian i remember so father mike tischel before he was ordained he was the crossroad director he was working mm -hmm. in the ovm and um he started this program called EPV. And this was specifically for undergrad seminarians, and it was called Exploration of Priestly Vocation. Huh. Okay. And so I helped him. You know, he asked me to help him kind of like be like one of the student leaders of that group. And the whole idea of the group was simply to get the undergrad seminarians together and to bring in clergy from, you know, local ish, you know, from even, even as far as, you know, a couple hours away to come in and speak about their experience in the parish. And so I remember very distinctly one of um, one of my favorite sessions was, you know, this was right after I started dating my wife. So it was like kind of like middle, like probably my junior year of undergrad. Mm -hmm. And we brought in a priest by the name of Father Peter Orfanakos. Okay. And he serves at St. Barbara in Connecticut and um, Orange, Connecticut. And he did gave an amazing talk to like you know whatever eight there were like five or six or maybe seven or eight of us undergrad seminarians and he kind of like told us stories about the, about his parish you know some of the things he's been through and it's kind of the idea was like to kind of give us a sense of like you know this is what parish life is like you know try to learn some of these things try to like remember these things when you're learning here at seminary like take some of the take learn from the mistakes that I've made <laughs> the best, you know what I mean? the best so that you yeah. have a different perspective going into it. So like, you know, you can, you know, you can learn, you can learn this the hard way, the easy way, you know, the easy way is learning <laughs> yeah, from totally. my mistakes. The hard way is learning from your mistakes. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah definitely. So later on, I realized that, um, I think it was, it was, it was that day that I realized that he was actually my wife's uncle. Oh, wow. Um, another clergyman in the family, you know, look at that. <laughs> so, How, what's the count at now? Let's see. Dad, <laughs> brother, father-in-law, um, brother-in-law, 
Maria's uncle now. Five is that? Are that's there any... five? Yeah, yeah. Five. Right. And then that's... me. So, so six. It's almost a whole metropolis. <laughs> yeah, very small metropolis, but we could do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So anyway, like when when we you know things like that, like that all played into the formation that that I experienced on campus. You know, oh. obviously the chapel plays a huge role in that as yeah. well. You know, if you commit yourself to being in chapel, like you're going to be formed, whether you like it or not. Like you're going yeah. to. It's going to happen. It's going to it's going to happen. But if you don't go to chapel, you don't take advantage uh, of that. Time. Yeah. You're missing it out is on what that you formation. put into it, right? You get out what you put into it. Just like just like all things in life, just like the gym, just like studying, just like, like everything. Yeah. Exactly. What's the point of having a gym membership if you're not going to go to the gym? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. so yeah, we used to like, you know, we brought speakers in for this EPV group and like to me that was awesome because I was able to learn from some of these older seasoned clergymen who came in and spent their time speaking with us and teaching us. And, and this was like extracurricular, like it was outside of the classroom. Totally. Cool. Changes so, the dynamic, kind of changes. Maybe you're more open to listening um, than you would be in like a rigid classroom and, and stuff. And you're so right about the older clergymen. I remember we had the usual um, professors who are also priests that would lead the services in the chapel but you know at least once or twice a week there'd be a visiting clergyman who would who would um, celebrate the services and then they would offer their two or three minute you know mini sermon at the end of chapel just something heartfelt from them to the students of the school and, right. and a lot of those mini sermons were um, you know the things I remember most and and things I'll I'll think about today if I if I have a situation at the parish and I'm like, oh, I remember Father so and so and like always an uplifting, encouraging word. And so those are very valuable. And so good, good for the EPV course to kind of like realize the importance of that and uh and foster that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It really was it really was nice because it was intentional about bringing outside people in. Like yeah. you, got, you you knew the people on campus and you heard what they had to say a lot of times and mm -hmm. obviously we learned lots from them. But it was always nice to get like a fresh perspective, you know? Yep. A new voice. Yeah, definitely. Do you, I don't know if you remember, I think you were on campus at the time. Do you remember when the APC um, board members came up for, for, they had like their meetings twice a year on campus or right, something? Right, yeah. And they came up and they did like a big ice cream social. And then they yeah. had, I, I'm trying to remember when exactly. After Vespers one night, right? Yeah, and they and it was in the reading room, and they had like you know JP licks like giant tubs of J, JP licks for everyone, and then they yeah. like shared stories and like shared their experiences in parish life, and kind of like and like you know gave a lot of inspirational, um, you know stories and things that helped us, uh, you know so it's things like that, you know that was that I remember that really helped form and like am I gonna remember, like from a knowledge standpoint, like I don't have a photographic memory. So right. I'm not going to remember everything that they said. I may not remember much of the, what they said at all. Yeah. But I do remember the example they set. I do remember, I think in here, a lot of the lessons that they taught because, you know, I may not understand up here exactly to be able to, to like recall the lesson exactly. But, you know, there, once you learn a lesson, then it sinks in. Yeah. And then it kind of becomes part of you and it, it kind of forms how you act and how you carry yourself and you know, how it's you so respond to people. It's funny you mention that because I was just reflecting on one of my parish assignments um, in Boston. I would go and, and this priest at the parish, he was particularly engaging in his sermons. And I remember, you know, so for a year I attended that parish and I always remember like really enjoying his sermons, you know, leaving the church with a fresh perspective, a new perspective. But I was just reflecting a couple of days ago i can't remember what any of them were about like i can't i can't specifically remember uh, you right. know the advice or or maybe the gospel passage they wanted but i just remember the way i felt hearing them and so i think you know hopefully in some way they still have for me but you're right oftentimes it's not remembering the specific words um but um remembering the way that um you felt after them i think is is still meaningful too Right. And it, and that's like a, it's a really hard concept for us to grasp because it's very intangible. Yeah. Like this idea of formation. Right. You know, like we can't like, it, how, like, how do you measure it? You can't really measure it. There's no, there's no, you know, measure for that. So how, how do you understand it? Well, I don't know. It's just like, it's an innate thing. It's something that happens inside of you in that, you know, your heart and your soul is formed. Right. I don't know. It's, it's a, uh, I'm sure the fathers have something to say about it. But. <laughs> so somewhere in one of those books that they wrote. Yeah, right. uh, it's in there somewhere. Um, Father Dimitri, we're coming kind of towards the end of our hour. And what, what we do at this time is we like to ask our guests when they're not 
at the church or in the church office um, when they're not, um, you know, in work mode, shall we say, although we know it's it's not work. What uh, what kind of hobbies do you have? How do you like to spend your time um, outside of the church, shall we say? Sure. Yeah, um, I, I love I love to get to spend time with my wife. Of course, she is great. Is she we, done um, with her medical schooling now? I remember. So she did. She did PA school back when we were in Boston. Yes. And then right when COVID hit, she started working for a hospital. Oh, wow. And so um, once we moved to the area, now she works in pediatrics, outpatient pediatrics, awesome. which is great. Much awesome. better schedule than hospital hours. Totally. totally. Um, so she's a PA and uh, um, she's enjoying her work. But of course, you know, once we're off of work, it's like, all right, well, if we have enough daylight in Ohio, <laughs> remember, remember, we're in Ohio. So like, you know, it's not as bad as Boston. Like in the Boston dead of winter, you're like, it's it's probably 4 30 and it's dark outside right I, and, and even when the sun was up it was just a gray sky with like right a right thick blanket so, of, you can't even see the sun yeah so ohio northeast ohio is a little similar we're close to the lake you know lake erie so we get a lot of that lake effect you know cloud cover and all that and, and um uh but anyway once the days get longer we we like to spend time biking we go for bike rides there's cool. a couple of trails out here so we love biking um uh, we also play pickleball Oh, are you in the pickle? You would be in the pickleball. I bet that you always were like very fond of not only sports, but also games. And I feel yes. like pickleball is a great combination of like a sport and a game. Like, yeah. So exactly. Do yeah, they have yeah. pickleball courts in Ohio? I that'd be very cutting. There's head. a few pickleball pickleball courts around. Um okay. we actually we live on a dead end street. So we we actually we use sidewalk chalk and we make a uh oh, nice. uh, we measure out the court and everything. So that's that's fun. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, I love to play board games. I mean, growing up with all these siblings, we had to do something uh, to, 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 uh, get out our, our competitive nature, but sure. also have fun at the same time. So we, we played lots of board games. So, you know, board games are fun. Um, obviously like it's, it's a huge, huge blessing. And I don't want to, I don't want to like, you know, gloss over that. It's a huge blessing to be close to family. Yeah. You know, we're, we're an hour from an hour, hour and a half from like most of our family. That's amazing. So um, it's, holidays, it's a huge blessing birthdays. because yeah, holidays, birthdays, all these things we get to see our family. And so um, spending time with family is like a huge part of our lives as well. Um, uh, you know, there's, it's, you know, people, we, we, I remember at seminary, people would talk about, you know, when you graduate, when you go into the parish life, like you have to have work-life balance totally and, and so for important. me and for me it's very important it's almost almost sacred right to have to have family time you know because i i know i know how demanding parish life can be and um it can be very demanding but if you're not careful about the work-life balance it can really consume you yeah and while you know the hard thing is is that it's like well you know the working working for the parish being a priest serving the lord and like you could say well you can't work hard enough and you can't give enough time to that it's like that's true a lot of people have that mentality that's true but you don't want to overemphasize you know staying in the office an extra four hours because you're finishing up flyers for the spaghetti dinner you know kind of a thing that, <laughs> so true right yeah. it's like you know those things that, yes they're very important and it's so important to be there for people at the, the you know these hardest times of their lives and to be there of for course. their you know, to be there the best times of their lives. And like, yeah, obviously there's times where you need to just drop everything you're doing. Yes. And go run to the hospital, you know, or yeah. run over to someone's bedside. Like yeah. that's part of it. But, and the times where it's not, you know, emergent demanding, like it's important to take, to take time to be with family. So we really, we really cherish and love being able to spend time with family and um, we, we, we do as much as we can. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, hobbies well, what other hobbies I, I mean i love the nfl football I mean, it's, yes uh, who are you going for in the super bowl i must ask because uh, anyone but the chiefs okay um, good good i'm here in san francisco we're all we're all bored uh yeah. with niners so let's go niners yeah well you know it's like i mean i'm a ravens fan my my parents grew up in Baltimore, oh yeah so it was hard to it was hard to lose the afc championship game Oh but yeah, I, I will say you know we just I mean we lived in Boston in the prime of Tom Brady's career and like that was crazy to think yeah it was crazy to to be there for that but at the same time it's like we just finally got out of this you know 20 year dynasty of the Patriots being in the Super Bowl every other year and now and it's like back. now the Chiefs are like doing the same thing I'm like okay anybody but the Chiefs please yeah yeah 
All right. Well, let's, we'll be together rooting for the Niners then. I like that's it. That's right. That's thank right. You, Father. Cool. Well, yeah. Father Dimitri, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Path to the Priesthood. We, uh, we hope and pray that God blesses you with many more years of ministry in his church. And so you can continue doing all the good things you're doing for now and many years to come. And we look forward to seeing you all next time on Path to the Priesthood. Thank you. Have a good one. God bless. Thanks, Father.